What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20 by Tina Selig. Now, Tina Selig is a teacher on Stanford University's entrepreneurship program. And in this book, she says some of the thought exercises that she uses with her students, as well as her own observations and journey into entrepreneurship. What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20 by Tina Selig isn't going to break any new ground, but there are gems in here and these are powerful reminders to help us entrepreneurs stay focused. My name's Graham Brown, and this is my book review. What if you had the worst business idea in the world? What would it look like? Selling bikinis to people in the Antarctic, a heart attack museum, or cockroach sushi? Now the point is, you'd think those businesses, before they even stood a chance, were dead in the water. But what if somebody gave you that idea and you had to make it work? That is the challenge that Tina Selig set her students on the Stanford Entrepreneurship Program. So think of those again, selling bikinis to people in the Antarctic, heart attack museum, and cockroach sushi. Imagine you had to take on one of those and you had to make it work. You couldn't change the idea. Now it's interesting when set with this exercise, how entrepreneurial people really become. So selling bikinis to people in the Antarctic becomes a health boot camp in sub freezing conditions in the Antarctic where the goal is to fit into your bikini at the end of it. The Heart Attack Museum becomes this interactive walkthrough into health and preventative medicine and cockroach sushi becomes a go-to destination for adventurous diners. And interestingly when you look at it like that those ideas aren't so bad after all. So the point of this exercise is there are no good and no bad ideas in business. So that got me thinking about my current business projects. There are no good and no bad ideas in business. I know that. But the key takeaway, the key message from this lesson is that stop worrying about the idea. Take any idea and make it work because it's not about ideas. It's about execution. You can take a bad idea with great execution and you can have a great business. You can take a good idea with poor execution and you will have a poor business. So stop worrying about the idea. Stop worrying about whether or not it's the right idea or you can build a business out of this idea. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You can make cockroach sushi work. You can make any idea work. It's all about the execution. So stop wasting time and energy on that idea and start moving forward and focusing on the execution. Now, Tina Seeley recalls the story of showing her father, who was a corporate career man, her new business cards, which read Tina L. Seeley, President. To which her father, a little ruffled, said, you can't just call yourself president. In life, there are two types of people. The first type is those that wait for permission. These are people who live their lives in corporate ladders. You know, they wait to be promoted. Everything that they do in terms of success is about pleasing somebody else who gives them permission to move forward to the next stage. The second type of person doesn't wait, they pick themselves. If you wanna be a successful entrepreneur, you have to be the second type. Now, that reminds me, I know this story already, but what it tells me is, you know, that I don't need to have permission from anybody to do what I think I could do. So for example, I don't need to be an Ironman triathlete professional or a coach to share with you my journey or my story or to teach you something that I've learned in that process. I don't need to be a billionaire startup founder to teach you what I know about launching a business. I have something that I can share because I've learned it and that is useful for somebody else. 
It's like the challenge of asking somebody, can you write a love song? I think if pushed, everybody could write a love song. Why? Because everybody has loved and lost and learned something in their lives, right? And that is something that they could share with somebody else, whether it teaches them a lesson or whether it resonates with that person because it touches an emotion that that person feels as well. There's something in business which affects us entrepreneurs, which I'm very conscious of, and it's called the imposter syndrome. And the imposter syndrome basically says that we feel slightly out of place with our surroundings. We feel like we don't belong or somehow we faked our way to success. Now that can happen when you become successful or that can happen before you even start out on the journey because you feel somehow that you're not worthy of that position. Now, how does that happen? It happens because we surround ourselves with people who are the first type. So people who wait for permission. You can't become an expert. You can't become a president. You can't become a a world leading authority in whatever it is that you want because they're so used to other people giving them that permission. If you surround yourself with these people, you too think that that is normal and acceptable behavior. So for you to do that yourself and you to pick yourself, that becomes an outlier behavior. It becomes abnormal or unacceptable. So we absorb these ideas and norms from other people. So it's important to become a successful entrepreneur that we surround ourselves with people who pick themselves because then that becomes normal behavior for us. The last takeaway from what I wish I knew when I was 20 is the chapter titled The Secret Source of Silicon Valley, which I'd rather interpret as getting comfortable with failure. Now, Selig recalls the story of a Thai weightlifter who, winning gold in the 2008 Olympics, attributes her success to changing her name. What it seems that is in many cultures, failure follows you around for life. And the only way to escape a failure is to change your name, i.e. become a different person. So in Sweden, for example, when a company goes bankrupt, it stays in debt forever. Here in Japan, as an example, the best talent from universities don't dream of starting their own business or becoming a startup founder whatever it is that they do in Silicon Valley, for example. Here, they dream of working for faceless organizations like Sony or Mitsubishi. In Silicon Valley, it's different. Not because the debt and bankruptcy laws in Silicon Valley are different to the rest of America. What's different is the people. When you're surrounded by people for who failure is normal, then you too think that that's a normal set of behaviors. You don't fear it like you would if you surround yourself with people who are very fearful of failure. So it's quite understandable if you live in a culture where people are very fearful of failure, then it's very difficult for you to escape that fear, even if you're quite headstrong and very ambitious as an entrepreneur. What often happens is, and I'll talk about in a minute, is you have to change who you hang around with or leave that culture entirely. So how do you deal with failure? The first part is to expect it. It sounds obvious, but one of the examples that Tina talks about is Jeff Hawkins, who was the founder of Palm Pilot, one of those first PDAs that came onto the market in the late 90s. After Palm Pilot, he went on to become the CEO of Handspring, which launched a sort of pre-iPod, pre-iPad type PDA, the the Visor. And in the first few weeks of launching, they sold 100,000 units and everything was going really well and all the management were getting really excited about the launch. And Jeff Hawkins said, you know, things are going too well. Something is going to go wrong. So let's not get overexcited because in time, you know, the shit is really going to hit the fan. And what happens? 
the shit hits the fan. The supply chain goes belly up and all the payments go down the pan. If you expect it, when it happens, it's not such a big deal. The important thing is how do you actually deal with it when failure does happen? The first option is to criticize it. And I did this the other day. I made this mistake. You know, so in handing over my Amazon FBA business to my wife, the first shipment that she sent off to the warehouse all returned as distributor damaged, which means that every single item was not able to be listed, which means we lose time and we lose money. My initial reaction, and important is a reaction, my initial reaction was frustration and I was pretty pissed off. But then I realized this lesson is that failure is part of the process. If we criticize failure, it does two things. Firstly, the people around us learn that. And what they then do is they edit their goals and ambitions and behavior such that next time they'll aim low so they don't fail. So that then impacts us. If we criticize somebody for failure in business, we're going to get less back out of them. They aren't going to become better. The second reaction is it reinforces in ourselves that idea. And we too become less ambitious and less motivated because we don't want to fail either. We don't want that to happen. Subconsciously, we edit our goals because we don't want to fail. We aim low. So criticizing people both affects the people around us and us when it comes to failure. The second response is my preferred response now. And this is the challenge. This is the journey where I'm trying to overcome my reactions and trying to act in this situation. And that is to expect failure as part of the process and ask, okay, what can we do better? What can we do to make this situation better? What can we learn? What that then does is quite profound to both the people around you and to yourself. What it does is it builds confidence. It builds courage because you know, even if you fail, that you can deal with things. You have a plan. You have the capacity and the skill and the mindset to be able to deal with that failure. Therefore, you don't fear failure. And going back to the original situation, you know, success is really dependent on whether or not we fear failure. If we fear failure, we edit our goals, we don't become successful. If we have courage, we don't fear failure, we go out and try things, we make mistakes, and eventually we will, we will become successful because we will get it right after a number of failures and learning what actually works. So I think the importance of this point is who we hang around with. And I said this in the second point as well, how important that is in terms of shaping our success. And it's a really powerful message from this book, What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20. If I was 20 years old, the one thing I wish I knew was how important the people we hang around with are in shaping our own success. We tend to give ourselves too much credit for our own success, whereas actually so much of it is dependent on the people around us. Not in the sense that they will actually help us or open doors for us, but in the sense that their beliefs and their behaviors will shape ours. You know, you may not be able to move to Silicon Valley, but you have to create your own little Silicon Valley around you. You know, you have to create your own little environment of entrepreneurs, people who take risks, change makers, people of action, because that will impact you. If you want a better life, you have to change the people you hang around with and hang around with a better set of people. Maybe you can't change your family or your good friends, but what you can do is stop talking about business with them and stop trying to convert them into thinking the same way as you. Maybe they don't agree with you and your entrepreneurial ambitions. That's fine. Just don't talk to them about those ambitions. Rather, find a group of people that you can hang around with that will change your belief system and improve it, make you more entrepreneurial and make you more open to risk and failure. So that was my review of What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20 by Tina Seelig. What did you think? 
Were the messages in this book review that struck a chord with you? Were the things you agree with, disagree with? Were there things that you'd like to take away and think about as well? If so, leave a comment on this video. Now, maybe you've read this book already. If that's the case, what do you think? What were the takeaways from the book that worked for you? What did you like or dislike? I'd be really interested to know in your comments in this book, especially if you're thinking of buying this book as well on the basis of the review that I've just given you. So hopefully you like this video. Whether you like it or not, leave a comment. But if you like book reviews, if you're interested in books that are gonna help you improve your business and your life, subscribe to my YouTube channel. You've been watching my book review. My name's Graham Brown, this is Upschool. I'll see you tomorrow for a new book review.